Mas cadê? Ah, só agora não sei. Eu pedi para arrumar, mas não deixaram. Ok. So, hello everyone. So hello everyone, thank you all for coming for this workshop called IPv6, Why Should I Care? My name is Thiago Jun Nakamura, I'm from nick.br, and together with Eduardo, we will be the moderators for this session. I will be the on-site moderator, and Eduardo will be the online moderator. So what is our goal for this workshop? Our goal is to raise awareness to issues that related to digital inclusion internet users might face in the future deployment of IPv6. So this is a very important session for you to be here and discuss this IPv6 with everyone. So for this session, we have three panelists from the technical community. We have Mr. Mukonakon Tamon from AFRINIC, which will represent the African point of view about this issue. Mr. Marco Hogwanin from RIPE NCC, representing the European point of view about this issue, and Mr. Antonio Moreiras from NIC.br, representing the South American point of view about IPv6. So the agenda for this workshop, we have just 30 minutes, so we will be, need to be very tight in the schedule. Uh, the opening I'm doing right now, I will give the instructions for this tutorial, which will be a quiz. So it's a trick question quiz that uh, we have six minutes for each question, and we will give one minute for you to answer each question, and then each panelist will have five minutes to discuss one question, uh, each one. After this, we will have an open mic with the remaining time, and finally, the wrap up and conclusions. So, for this quiz, we will use something we, you already done in the beginning. So we use the platform called Slido. So, in order to use this platform, you have to access slide.do and enter the code IPv6. So, uh, for this session, we will start with Mr. Tamon with the first question, and we will project the code here so you can access this quiz. So we'll give one minute for you to answer the first question. And afterwards, Mr. Tamon will discuss the results with everyone. Oh, if someone has any trouble using the Slido, Natalia can help. She is delivering the instructions on paper. Okay, Mr. Tamon, you have five minutes to discuss this question. Uh, thank you very much. The, the results of the poll aren't surprising. 
but it's a classic example of what we call the swimmer's body's illusion. So if you look at the swimmer, they have this amazing body. That body that they have, is it because they swim, or is it because of the body that they're able to swim well? It's an example of what's happening here. So when we talk about digital inclusion, there are about five key pillars, only three of which are really relevant to the issue of uh, IPv6 transition. One of the pillars is affordable and robust broadband infrastructure. So what we find that the most important things here are economic viability of the broadband service and the quality of the infrastructure. So I don't expect um, V4 to V6 transition to make much of an impact here because um, even if the government is stepping in to do some kind of, um, um, some kind of um, endeavor to bring people in, it still has to be economically viable. So I think the economic models and the availability of infrastructure is a lot more important than uh, the transition to IPv6. And in any case, all over the world, whether there's low broadband, no infrastructure, pretty much everyone uses NAT. So the exact same things that's going to happen to, um, in Africa or in any other part of the world will happen in the most advanced economies that, are, that have broadband and still using uh, carrier grid NAT. Now, the second aspect of digital inclusion is internet-enabled services, internet-enabled devices that meet the needs of the user. Now, almost every end-user device that's made in the last three to five years already supports IPv6. The question then goes back to economics. How much do they cost? I know there are, um, there are different programs to try and get you know, Android devices at less than $60. That might still be expensive for some people. And quite frankly, that might not be their biggest priority. Um, the biggest concern for us is that you know, people who are most susceptible to digital exclusion Buying the latest device or changing it every three to five years is not a priority to them. And so we are much more at risk of you know, dumping devices that are being used in more advanced economies being dumped onto the continent, which then has this perverse effect of you know, making it difficult to transition to IPv6. Then the last one, which I think has the highest impact on the transition is going to be applications that are designed to enable and encourage self-sufficiency. And the particular aspect of IPv6 that's useful to this is the end-to-end -end capability. Right? And so if such devices are created, like the ability to you know, remotely access some device in your house, maybe turn off the fridge, any region of the world that hasn't moved to IPv6, be it in Africa or be it in Europe, that is behind several grids of carrier grid NAT, is still going to, to suffer. So in a nutshell, I think um, digital inclusion, the bigger effect is from the consumer perspective. And given that most of the world already still uses carrier grid NAT anyway, it's a bit simplistic to look at it from um, a regional perspective rather than the adoption of some technological standards for deploying broadband to users. So that's my perspective. If you have any questions, I'll take them. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Tamon. And now we will proceed to the next question. <coughs> okay, we'll give him one more minute for you to answer. And then Mr. Hagwoning will discuss later.
Okay, Mr. Hogwin, you can start. Yes, thank you. Good, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm, I'm, it, it, it's an interesting result. Uh, there's no issue for the end user. At least some people still believe that they're fine. Uh, that's, that's, that's interesting, but yeah, um, I would say it, it, it all would apply, but let me talk you through, through some, of, some of why this is and uh, start with the basic problem that we're trying to solve is that IPv4 only has 4 billion addresses and we're way more than 4 billion people on this world, let alone if you count all their devices. Uh, so the question then becomes, what do you do? Because like all other <coughs> Internet registries, RIPE NCC has also run out. You can ask us, but unfortunately, I can't give you any IPv4 because uh, I don't have them anymore. Um, well, in that scenario, there are basically two options. Uh, one of them, and and, and Mukum already talked a bit about it, is, is is fairly common and is address sharing. If you can't have your own address, then maybe you can share it. And that's indeed the technique that, that Mukum talked about, is network address translation or carrier grade net, where I use one address to access the internet with multiple users. And in fact, we're using that right now here in this IGF network as well. So I can kind of see why you, from a user perspective, think like, oh, everything is fine. Because, yes, here your internet works. Uh, the bigger trouble there is realize what you might miss out on on future development, uh, which is one thing. We always talk about the internet as an open platform that supports rapid innovation. But with those carrier-grade nets, you severely limit the options in, in, in what you can do and what you cannot do. And, and, and some people also in earlier IGFs talks about the webification of the net. Most, most of what you see these days is turned into web applications. And one of the reasons people choose that is because network address translation kind of forces you into that model. It's very hard to set up direct communication. So, while you might not lose anything, you might miss out on, on the real benefits and the future options of this internet. Now that's address sharing. Of course, the other part is where you might encourage other people to sell you an address. We know that there are still organizations that may have more addresses right now than they need, and those exchange hands. There is an active market in IPv for addresses, but they come at a cost. And a rough estimate is somewhere in the region of 25 or 30 dollars per IP address. Now think about that. If your internet provider has to shell out 30 dollars just to get the address to connect you to the internet, what does that do with your price, do you think? So as the options go, Yes, price increases will happen, and the same goes for net. It, it's fancy equipment, and it's really good these days, but it comes at a cost. These are big boxes. You have to connect hundreds of thousands of users in a system that shares addresses. You're talking millions and millions of hardware that your provider has to buy because he has to use IPv4. Or, well, let me phrase it differently. He chooses to only use IPv4, because that, of course, the obvious answer is like, the moment you move to IPv6 is that a lot of traffic already can be done over IPv6. The big content providers, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Netflix, all support IPv6. So even while not the whole internet is IPv6 yet, the moment you switch on IPv6, you see an immediate benefit for your users you see an immediate speed increase because you no longer rely on network address translation. That the net result there is also that we can do with smaller boxes, which are cheaper. So it's, it's often not like, yeah, right now where you sit in an IPv4 only world, everything looks fine. But once you step over that line and you go to IPv6, you all of a sudden unlock a world of possibilities. It's faster. It's cheaper, so and 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 
what I often see is, is especially from a user perspective, is simply the frog in boiling water. You don't know what you're missing out on because you don't see what the possibilities are for IPv6. I'll uh, leave it here and we can come back to questions later, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hogwoning. And now for the last question, we will give one more minute for you to answer. And afterwards, moderators will discuss it. So, okay, Mr. Moreiros, you can start your discussion. Greetings for everyone. Uh, I'm speaking here, <coughs> sorry, I'm speaking here in my now capacity as a person and as internet user, as an engineer. It's very good to see you here, and it's good to see you interested in IPv6 because not everyone can see the importance of IPv6 yet. You see, the IGF network, I mean the Wi-Fi network we are using, the internet connectivity that we have here is limited since we do not have IPv6 connectivity. Uh, this is totally unexpected in the Internet Governance Forum network, and it is really, really a shame. Well, to the question, uh, in the next five years, what will happen to digital inclusion related to IPv6? This seems to be, it seems to me, to be a difficult question, but it's not. The answer is, in fact, really, really very easy and simple, straightforward, and in a few moments I will give it to you. Now I invite you to think about the future we want to the internet. Do we want one net, one single worldwide network, decentralized, composed of tons of independent networks, but yet forming one single and wonderful global network? If so, technically we cannot rely only on IPv4 simply because it is exhausted and it, it will be impossible to use IPv4 alone to connect our people, our organizations, our communities and our things. And if we think about it, IPv4 addresses now have prices, very high prices. We have permitted, we have allowed that instead of a limited numbering resource that had to be globally managed, IPv4 addresses have now become a good, a good traded in a market. And that's a new wow, a new barrier to the internet. If we want one net, we also do not want CGNAT to be the main technical solution that will bring connectivity for the today unconnected half of the world. 
CG NAT leads to network fragmentation in a technical sense, in an unintended, not proposital way, CG NAT make the networks more isolated. In an internet with NAT and with CG NAT, it's more difficult for applications to communicate. The software has to be more elaborated, more expensive, and in some cases, the communication is almost impossible. Today, we see communications uh, failures every day. In 2018, last year, we organized a panel here in the IGF to discuss the difficulties that some internet users are facing to play online games because of CGNet and lack of IPv6 support. We choose to talk about games because it's an important industry, it moves a lot of money. But the complexity and the connectivity problems we have today because of CGNAT affects a wide range of applications in the internet. If we want one net, we have to consider that in the emerging internet of things, we will need full connectivity, easy connectivity, inexpensive connectivity, fast, secure, and reliable connectivity. Digital inclusion is about bringing connectivity to people and why not to the things? But more than that, it's about enabling, en en enabling people, organizations and communities to use the internet in a significant way to them, in the best possible way, in a way that will improve their lives and the world. To have one net, one full network, the internet in its total capacity, the best internet possible, today we do need IPv6. So what was that simple answer? What will happen to digital inclusion related to IPv6 in the next five years? Well, it will happen what we want to. It will happen what we work for. We, the organizers and speakers in this session, we are working actively to foster IPv6 deployment. We are talking to people, we are teaching and training the technical community, we are showing the economics of the situation to the management of the companies, we are deploying IPv6. In the last 10 years, Nick.br, the organization I work for in Brazil, has provided more than 200 IPv6 training classes, free of charge. We have trained more than 6,000 professionals in Brazil. We organized tens of events and coordination meetings. And we are getting results. The answer is easy. We want one net. We want the better internet possible for everyone and for everything. We want more digital inclusion. And to have all this, the internet needs IPv6. Then we will have all this and we will have IPv6 deployed throughout the internet. So I, I will ask you an uh, infinitely more difficult question. What kind of the internet do you want and what will you do for it? And that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Moreiras. And now we end the, the, the quiz. And we will start the open mic session. So if ever anyone wants to ask a question or to make a comment, please. Can I, can I maybe ask, like, out, out of you who said, like, ah, I don't see a problem. Did, did, did we change your mind? Do you start now sort of see the problem space? Hello. Uh. Hello. My, my name okay. is Constance Berger from the Ministry of the Interior of Germany, and we are going to deploy a slash 23 for the public administration of Germany. Um, for, for my opinion, that's not the question if, that's the question how, and um, in, in, in which kind of way we, we want to implement it. In, um, from my perspective, the uh, uh, deployment of IPv6 in the, in the, the governments are a bit um, different than 
in, um, in the way ISPs um, going to deploy, deploy IPv6. And so we um, have to, to think about more organizational stuff and um, standardization, and we have to talk with each other. We have uh, constitutional rights, we have a federal system, and so the, this um, belongs also for us, for a, uh, for a good deployment and for a good uh, future infrastructure. So um, we are absolutely um, convinced that we have to go forward. Okay, thank you, Mr. Constance. Uh, do any panelists want to make a comment? So, Mr. Swiss, please. Uh, hello, Sami Suisi from RCEP France. Uh, thank you very much for this panel, and I uh, agree with uh, most of the things that uh, have been said. Like, uh, just to come back to the issue of price, the price is not related to the non-deployment of IPv6. The price is related to the fact, I think, of not getting rid of IPv4, especially on fixed lines, etc., because the price will carry on uh, eventually if it gets high, because we will always need IPv4 if IPv6 is not generalized. And we have, we're so far from this point from here. So if you have some forecasts or some ideas regarding to this, I take. Oui. Yeah. Forecasts, predicting the future is always hard. I mean, that's, 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 that we can, I can use my glass ball, but I don't think it's right. Now, um, uh, I think, I think if, you, if you look at it from market dynamics, like I said, as the scarcity increases, prices will go up. Uh, at the same time, we have to, although, although getting IPv6 addresses from your internet registry is, is virtually for free, uh, of course, the deployment still has a cost. You might need to replace some hardware here and there. You might need to adjust some software systems. So there will always be a cost in deploying IPv6. Uh, what we expect to happen is that sooner or later the price of IPv4 will outweigh sort of the cost of deployment of IPv6. If, if, if you take a very market approach, the reason that IPv6 isn't globally deployed yet is probably because it's still more expensive than it is to stick with IPv4. And in that sense, the scarcity hopefully will drive that price to a point where we actually invert that curve and doing IPv6 is the cheaper option. Uh, when that is going to happen, uh, I don't know. I also am not expecting it to happen on the global scale. You probably see more local markets like, uh, as Constance points out, here in Germany 50% of the users are on IPv6, which means that for a German government, 50% of their users can come in over IPv6, which might make deploying IPv6 a more feasible option than, for instance, in a country like Denmark, where hardly anybody uses IPv6 at the moment. So, I, but yeah, a, a global, eventually, we kind of hope that and expect that, that IPv4 will disappear because IPv6 is the cheaper option also for network operators. So, as you can see, IPv6 is a very present matter. So, even uh, for the technical community, it's always have been an important matter. But I think that uh, with this workshop, uh, it's to maybe to other people that aren't from the technical community also realize that IPv6 is important for them, even if they don't fully understand the issue. But uh, this workshop has this proposal, and I hope uh, everyone here had a good time. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists for coming here and discussing this matter with us, and I would like to thank you all, the audience, and both online uh, for this participation. So thank you very much for the session, and I hope to see you again.